And here we are about to go live. Oh, we're live. Yo, yo, yo. Good morning. Good afternoon. Salutations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're here. We made it. I used to. I used to like to say, like, we're here and we're queer, but I'm not queer. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's just my black side saying. You know, what I, mean? I like to rhyme, but. I'm sitting here and I'm I'm it's Sunday morning. We got two black guys on the podcast. J Jared didn't even show up. And we're on time. So can yes. we get <laughs> can we get a <laughs> kudo for that if you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but we got a brother in Canada. Um he's got his own following. He does his own thing. Um, and then I'm in Washington. It's funny because I, for a while there, I thought I was the only black autist. And then I found this guy, thanks to my friend Statuesque in Canada. And I was like, oh shit, there's another one of me, except for he's more on the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there in a minute. Yeah, it's okay. funny to me because people always have a laugh. I don't think people understand that autism isn't about, uh, how you look per se, right? It's yeah. more about how you talk, how you sound, um, how you handle adversity, <laughs> and how you uh, handle those awkward situations. But we'll get in that in a minute. Um, today, yeah. our guest is Ryan Perez out of Canada. What part of Canada are you from, Ryan? Again? I'm I'm out of Alberta, um, Calgary, Alberta. So that's uh, probably about three ways away from. Uh, I would say from a Montana. Montana? Oh, so you're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, <laughs> we're up, <laughs> we're up in the prairies. So, you know, uh, Beyonce did that, like, you know, that 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 new country song. I think there's a writer that lives where we live because we have we're we're in the cowboy. Uh, we're like the, in the Texas version of Canada. Okay. I yeah. I definitely won't be going then. Um, I didn't <laughs> like I didn't like American Texas, so I'm not sure if I'm gonna like Canadian Texas, right? Like, it, it, yeah, that a boot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's they talk like that in in Toronto. They they're like uh, it's like a like a, an Irish. I don't know. I can't I can't put my finger on it, but the the a boot is like more more east and in the west. Like fucking a hey, fucking rice, you know, like that kind of thing. Am I allowed to cuss? <laughs> yeah, you're. Uh, yes, I do edit this later. You're just giving me more work for later, which is fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> it's fine. I'm gonna fucking cuss, so um, <laughs> it's okay if you fucking cuss. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny being in being in Washington. I actually go to, you know, Canada. Oh, that's I awesome. Performed in BCA, and uh, I didn't know you guys are fucking racist up there. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, like, it can't. Yeah, it's a ahead. little different though because it's not so much against us; it's against the Native Americans. And oh I yeah, know, I didn't know about. I yeah, I like the way you're like. Oh yeah, you didn't know. Like, yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> it's not even that. It's it's it. They're like Canada is racist. Period, and it's um, but it's covert. So you don't um, uh, you don't really you can't really see it unless you. You 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 until you still you pay attention because you look at our politics and you look at you look at our politicians and stuff like that. Yeah, there's some diversity there, but there there's still a lot of racism, and we're so spread out, right? We don't have like really huge populations of black people unless you go to Halifax, unless you go to places like Toronto, you know, you know the rest of the place, you know, you it's it's racist and people smile in your face and they'll pretend like they're not, um, but you know, there's not much, uh, you know, and we all have like, we say that we're a multicultural country where uh, everybody can preserve their culture and stuff like that. We're not a melting pot like America is, but even despite the multiculturalism, I, I, I still find Canada very racist and not inclusive as much as they like to promote that it is. 
<laughs> you know, that's the thing about racists. I don't think they're ever really honest about how racist they are, are they? <laughs> 100%. It's funny, I, well, you already tackled one of the questions. Being a, a black guy, I don't know if you know I was black, but I'm mixed. Um, being a mixed guy, Samoan-looking guy in Seattle, uh, everybody says I talk funny. I don't have an accent. And when I heard you, I was like, he sounds like he's from Seattle. He doesn't have an accent either. <laughs> Wait, are you born and raised in, in uh, Cal- Alberta? Yeah, born born and raised in Calgary, Alberta. I call myself a Canadian. My parents are from the Car- Caribbean. Um you know, my my mom's from Trinidad. My biological father is from um, my both of my parents are from Trinidad, but my biological father is from uh, Guyana. So we're Caribbean, you know, so my parents have accents and, you know, we do sell it like celebrate our Caribbean culture. But, you know, I'm, I'm personally Canadian because anytime I go to Trinidad, everybody's like, you're a foreigner. <laughs> you don't belong here. And, no. And, and they don't they talk very high. I've I. <laughs> So I went to Morehouse College, right? And yeah. I'd never met anybody from Trinidad, Tobago. And then I met them. They have this high tone. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They're playing. And I was, I, what the fuck is that? And they, what do you mean? And I was, that is not, like, they, most of them look, again, like you do. Very yeah. Very dark, very of African descent. So I'm at Morehouse College. I don't know if you know, but that's an all-black school. And you see this dark-skinned brother, and then he sounds like, to me, it sounds more like an Indian accent. Yeah, it's kind of because the the culture is mixed, right? So it's a melting pot in Trinidad with uh, Indi- Indian influence and African influence, our our food, our cultural food and stuff. But you know, yeah, we have a little twang in our voice, but we'll cuss you down, we'll burn you to the ground. There's nothing like a Trinidadian cuss. Um, we will, you know, and it's it is it is probably when well, you take all the Caribbean cultures and you boil it down. Um, Trinidadians are probably this the most witty, clever, you know, uh, people that will cuss you out. Unlike Polish people, is what you're saying? Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that joke holds true in Canada too. All right, I'll take it. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know. I was just laughing. You know, I was just trying to fit in. You know, oh, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Whatever, buddy. You're not that. Autics don't do that. I know better. <laughs> You'd be like, I don't. I don't get it. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I've I've done this show with different varying levels of autism and autism and people, and it's funny because a lot of times we don't get humor. And I'm a comedian, and people are like, "How do you not get humor?" And I was like, "Just because something's funny to me doesn't mean it's funny it to somebody else, right?" That's right. And then secondly, I don't know when people are joking, so that doesn't mean I'm always gonna figure out. You know what I mean? Like. Hey, people ask me, and I'll be like, I'll answer the I was a joke. Like, oh. Yeah. I you know, that's the thing about comedy. I love comedy because um I love comedy because it I studied it when I was young because I wanted to know how to talk and like wanted to know how to like mix in with people and stuff like that. And you know, and you know, you can any autist can learn a thing or two by just studying comedians because you know, if you can make a person laugh, you can make them cry. If you can make a person cry, you can make them do anything that you want to do because it's all in the art of storytelling. And, you know, some things are funny, but a lot of humor has been reduced down to um, ableism, sexism, homophobia, so on and so forth. So, you know, like autists f- don't find bullying funny, but a lot of our culture is around bullying. Um, you can, <laughs> yes. I've, I've proven on my channel that you could be funny, uh, without having to drag someone to the ether to do so, you know, it's just being witty and clever and stuff. And they, everybody thinks my stuff is funny and they're all autists. So, you know, what's the deal? Why, why is it that people think that we can't, we, we don't know how to make people laugh because the jokes are not the greatest. Like I watch Saturday night live. Um, some of this stuff is funny, but not all of it. You know what I mean? And and there's just certain things that I watch and I'm just like, what? Where's the funny in that? It just looks dry and, you know, it's just like, ugh. Well, you went there, so I'll go there. I think what it is is the white narrative in comedy, right? And what I mean by that is, is so I don't want, once had somebody tell me I did racist jokes. How? I'm mixed. So if you're mad at me talking about white people, you're forgetting I'm white. Right. 
right? And I don't talk about white people. I talk about my experience as a mixed person, which means I make fun of some of my white interactions, right? But then right. again, I make a joke about how I'm 60% white, so I guess I'm not an angry black guy. I'm an angry <laughs> white guy, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Fuck you. You were supposed to laugh that hard, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. He's like, I just thought you were angry little Samoan, man. It's all right. <laughs> Fuck, you guys are all angry. There's a whole island of you. I'd be angry too, though. <laughs> <laughs> but it's things like that where, like, I don't, I don't think people understand. There's a difference between... And and I'll go there. I love Dave Chappelle, right? right? I think he's a great actor. I think he's a great comedian. I even understand what he's doing right now. Because for the people who don't understand what Dave Chappelle is doing right now, he's not being transphobic. He's not being any of those things. What he's saying is, is you guys paid me billions of dollars to say the word nigga and make fun of myself. So now I'm going to make fun of other people. And if right. you find that offensive that I say that that, I, that I'm making fun of trans folks when he's not actually making fun of trans people, right? Let's pause there for a second. There are some things he does that are issues or maybe, but th he's talking about his experiences with people. So he's not talking about them as a whole. He's talking about his experience that he has with his trans fan or his trans person. The problem people have is that. Not every comic can go on stage and make those jokes about their experience. They're usually making them about people. Right. And so now Dave Chappelle is the poster boy for shitty comedians, kind of like Trump is the poster boy for shitty racists, right? Well, all right. racists are shitty, right? And it's the same idea. Now, if, if people would make jokes about their interactions with somebody and somebody doesn't like it, you can be upset at that or whatever, but at least that's their experience. And they're not punching down or labeling or making a group. And I think that's where, especially these new age comedians, you know, the white guys, the new, you know, what are they, what do we call them? The edge lords, right? The people right. that want to, they want to go to that edge and make fun. But you got to understand, you can't do that, right? And, and right. the biggest, biggest thing people understand is, Everything they asked Dave Chappelle to do, everything they asked Kenan Thompson to do, everything they asked the new black guy on Saturday Night Live to do, every time we've got a black character on TV, we're shucking and jiving, right? We're saying yo, 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 or we're being too white, and we're liking blackish where he doesn't even say, you know what I mean? Like, there's no balance. And right. so I don't agree with it. I don't do trans jokes. I got one gay go joke that I do. And it's kind of funny, right? And it's some it's a work in progress. But even that joke, I don't just do it yet because I haven't crafted it, right? And I also know it's not a joke about those people, right? Right. And in a real short sense, I, I and I'll tell the joke quickly is I go, Hey, I try to hang out with my friends and go to a gay bar. And they're like, uh, that sounds gay. And I was like, No, we're just gonna go hang out, have some drinks and make some friends. And they're like, No, no, that sounds gay. So I went with my gay friend, and after a couple hours, I noticed I wasn't getting hurt on, and I got mad. And the guy was like, basically, everybody can tell because the way you tie your tie that you don't, you're not gay. And I was like, that's fucked up, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm a pretty bitch. I want a couple drinks. I want to get a couple people on, right? <laughs> you got rejected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you get my point now. It, it right. has nothing to do with being gay, right? Right. And, you know, I think the thing is, is that with Dave Chappelle, that whole um, that whole uh, his comedy skits are very clever and witty. But, you know, when you are trying when you're you you have a big platform like what he has and people miss the mark or they don't understand it, they don't get it, then you miss the mark. I think that his he's a, a, a hilarious comedian. And I think what people are expecting from him to be you know, they're expecting him um, to to put a little bit more work in those jokes because it's funny to us. It's funny. It's like funny in a sense because we understand the the science behind what he's doing, right? We understand that he is just making a point that there are discrepancies between um, racism that we allow um, and that we overlook, but when it comes to other communities, they get a little bit more support. But 
you know, he just uses the most, you know, like obvious jokes. And I think that with his stature and with his intelligence, he could be more, more um, intelligent about how he, how he delivers a joke. I think like when it comes to jokes, I think it's important for everybody to understand that you either live in a bias or you live in a rational brain where you can actually learn about these different cultures and then craft a joke that you know can is not only punching down but you can craft a joke that is that is witty and clever a lot of people don't want to put in the work to actually learn about the different cultures to learn about different um you know uh uh sexualities to learn about polyamory or to learn about whatever it could it doesn't matter um mm -hmm. it's just that you have to take the time to learn and hear the perspectives of the people that you want to make a joke about right if you don't listen and then the joke is always going to come off wrong right and obviously he wants to cater to his belief systems or cater to an audience he's trying to do it but it's not well thought out so that's why i can get why a lot of people uh don't find his jokes funny um, and they're looking for more craft into what he's saying. But I think people who are smart enough to understand comedy understand what he's doing. We know that he doesn't believe that kind of stuff. I, I don't believe he believes that stuff. I just think that he's just saying it to say it. Like his last comedy skit where he was talking about how the disabled the people in the back, you know, are just they you know they're here to hear the the the, the homophobia homophobic jokes and the trans jokes right like and he makes fun of them now so and it's funny because <laughs> yeah there's a truth to it there's a truth there's, there's a truth and, yeah and that's that's what i i think i think you hit it had uh, in a i'll say this i think white americans once you get rich enough they want to turn all black people into role models right and Dave Chappelle's like, I'm not a fucking role model. I'm a comic. And he's right and he's wrong. Right. And I think he's 97% right. Right? The 3% wrong is that we're on the internet now. Right. It's that everything's pictured, everything's zoomed in. And then on top of that, we have to deal with these white peers. <laughs> God. Well, we have to like we we are all sharing the same space, and you know when we have these platforms, we're expected to perform, and we're not expected to bring our marginalization to the the conversation. Bingo. You know, so we we are here, but we we we're not allowed to remind people that we're black, right? Because that's the problem with <laughs> with you know like we're we're successful now, and like that's the that's the metrics, right? The, the metrics is okay. I get it. I am poor and I'm black and therefore I have racism in my life. And then I get rich. Oh my God. Racism disappears. I'm no longer marginalized. <laughs> right. You hear Der Ben Shapiro, uh, you know, he's always talking really fast and you know what I mean? Like, you know, the, the poverty rate is this high, blah, 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 blah. And you you know, you think you listen to him and all he's talking, every person who, you know, is racist. Um, every person will talk like, the only metrics to measure racism is economic status of a black person. And, you know, they, they don't think that black first, they think black is a skin color. So anytime you mention black, you're like, why did he have to bring race into this? And it's like, bitch, uh, we're not <laughs> talking just about race. We're talking about uh, culture. We're talking about experiences. We're talking about things that you will never be able to experience. So when we're talking from a black perspective, we're talking from a cultural perspective because only us would know, like Denzel Washington would talk, talked about this, where, you know, like the, 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 the curling iron or, or not the curling iron, the straight, the, the flat iron, the way that it hits the stove and how it crackles. We know that experience. We know how it, what it smells like. We know that experience. And white people will never know what it's like to put a hot comb um, <laughs> in in your hair, right? So we are we have an experience of being black. And when we bring those experiences up, um, there's a lot of trauma. There's you know they talk about intersectionalities and stuff like that. There's a lot of trauma that we've experienced that nobody really gets. So you know. Um, that's it's the same thing that I'm experiencing with the autistic uh, autistic autistic community is that, um, you know, sometimes my content can be a little bit dark 
Well, because, you know, growing up black and autistic is kind of dark, you know, and there is a lot of nuance in our communities, you know, and people are like, oh, my God, black people are not really good with mental health. Oh, my God, black people are just really <laughs> ableist. And it's not that it's that black people had to grow up in a white society and made us perform and made us hoot and holler and jump for them. And we then impose that on our children and on our culture. So, you know, white people also have to take responsibility for, you know, for they have to take responsibility for the expression. You didn't like the you didn't like the response, then change the approach. Hello. And I, I, I how old are you, my ass, Brian? I'm 40 years old. Oh, perfect. So we're the same, basically the same age. So I'm I'm 42 and I was uh I'm I'm self-diagnosed or late diagnosed kind of like you. Yeah. But here's the thing is I grew up going to boiler room classes and you know what I'm talking about, right? And portable classes as a kid. Right. Well, guess what those are? Right now those are called behavioral or neurodivergent classrooms. Mm. That's where all the kids who are on an IEP go. So right. What you're telling me is even though I haven't looked at my school record, I spent my whole elementary school's and middle school years going to places on an IEP. What does that sound like? Undiagnosed autism. We also know that autism was a white disease until about 2010, right? right. Michael Che made a joke about, I didn't know black people could get autism. We're moving up in the world. <laughs> 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 and I've, I've done this show enough to even talk about how when a white person gets a diagnosis, it's like, okay, when a black person gets a diagnosis, it's like, shit, they must have Down syndrome or something. Because black people will be like, I don't know if my baby's going to make it. Not the autism. And it's like, what, they're not going to have friends for a while? Okay. Right. They're probably not going to socially drink and get high and use drugs because they're not cool enough. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. Like when they do, you know, do... Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Sorry. Like, it's funny because people... We are so good at masking that, uh, you know, we, we, the only time autism works for us is when we want to go to jail. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> if I want to, if I want free rent and I want free food, I just have to have an autistic meltdown. You know what I mean? <laughs> Arrest me. <laughs> Arrest me. I, I, I need to go to jail. You know. You laugh about that, but I think the most humbling picture, and I've talked about this before, I don't know if you saw it, but it was in America when the large 12-year-old kid or 13-year-old kid was having a mental breakdown, and his black, I don't know if it was his caseworker, it wasn't his parent, but his black peer, or not peer, but guidance counselor or whatever, had to sit on the ground with him to stop the police from shooting him. Right. And I was like, that's the black autist. That's that's what I grew up being. And not only that, but I, I'm assuming I'm a lot huger than you just by your stature. But I'm six foot two, 300 pounds. I've been 5'11 since I was in like fifth grade. So kids used to, kids used to call me nigger and then I'd go beat them up and I'd really beat them up and then I'd get in trouble for it. Well, it's right. not my fault. The white kid called me nigger. Like, we're not going to address that. We're just going to talk about how I took Kyle to the, to the hospital, right? Well, well no. it, it 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 happened to me too. But like, uh, I remember this kid named Cameron on the bus. We were uh, uh, this kid named Cameron. Um, he was like, uh, what what did he say? Um, he would always bully me and stuff like that. And I was always like, just taking it, you know, like, and I have a like a pattern, right? Like, I'll take it to until i have a meltdown and when i have a meltdown then i turn into hulk and you know and i punched that kid right in the balls and he cried and then everyone got mad at me on the bus so i learned very quickly that you know when people are bullying me it's okay um and when i fight back it's not okay the other the other incident was when I was in the lineup and the kid spat on me. He he you know had a bunch of water in his mouth and he looked at me and he spat on me and I remember it till this day. You know, um, we go into uh, I go I go and tell the teacher. The teacher takes him and I. Well, because I couldn't express myself, the kid got away with it, right? And I've just lived my whole life like this. You know, like the other day. I like as an autistic person, I have stuff 
um, like I record conversations sometimes and I put all of my data onto a, um, I put all my data into this, this thing. So this, this software, they deleted all the videos uh, because they reneged on an unlimited deal and they want me now to pay a monthly subscription for this, this product. And called berry cast it's called berry cast um and i you know can't fight back can't say nothing you just have to accept it and then you know here's buddhism folks like you know just gotta meditate it out and you can't really say much about it so you know we are taught to what did you say i said thoughts and prayers buddy thoughts and prayers (laughs) just make just 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 make more money you know what I mean? Just make more money and everything will be okay. And it's like, no, when we experience these, when we're in distress and we're experiencing these sort of things, nobody comes to our aid. I was charged when I was a little kid or I, when I was in high school, I was charged with disorderly or orderly conduct. I got it pardoned, but I was charged with disorderly conduct because I was cussing out a girl that was, you know, bullying me in the classroom. So when I got outside, I wanted to, like, I just cussed her ass out in front of everybody she they charged me for that you know so it it um you know nobody loves an autistic meltdown when it comes from a black person but when a white person does it um they're like oh my god let's call his parents let's do this this stuff so we have to change the conversation around um you know uh, we need to bring attention to black um autists because you know we are we're going through much more because of some of our situations and our our cultural backgrounds and that's it. I was kicked out of my home last year in October, um, you know, and I'm still homeless. I have one more month while I'm in refuge. One of my clients let me use his home. And um, I just had a mental breakdown. I was an entrepreneur. I was doing my thing, paying my bills, but autism got the best of me. And I had a, be- I had a meltdown. And when I started talking about it online, because my family wasn't didn't want to do anything about it, my the people that I was working with, clients didn't care about it. Um, I went online and I just that's why I started this content because I needed a way to express it myself. And people said I was scamming pokes because I I put a GoFundMe campaign together. Well, it wasn't even a campaign for my living situation; it was a campaign to just support me as a as as a creative artist on these platforms because we don't get paid in Canada on TikTok. We don't get paid. So I said, Hey, just, if you see gratitude, just send me a dollar, send me two, because if you guys are supporting me, I wouldn't be homeless. Right? Like I could take time for my mental health away from my stuff, but no, people thought I was scamming people. They didn't believe I had autism. And, you know, and I conclude by saying that black people are not safe especially when we have mental health issues. You know, people want to take that time to punish us for our expression. And, you know, I'm starting to get a little bit of mutual aid now, but people still haven't donated. People still haven't supported. They watch us. They watch us die. And then they go, they go into um, this mode when we succeed, like, oh my God, what is... This is such a great story. Let's put it in a movie. You know what I mean? Like you you, oh, you survived without any of our help. And we have to change. That's why I'm advocating, why you're advocating, because we need to change this narrative. Black people are human. We experience pain just like the say of the rest of y'all. You know, we deserve oh, yeah, to maybe, be supported, right? Maybe, maybe worse. And I, I talked to somebody about this. The uh, there's this ever this is this forever age battle on who has it worse, black men or black women, right? Mm-hmm. And I've always said it's black men. And I get the idea that women are are raped and pillaged. Don't get me wrong. There's that whole facet that men really don't go through, right? But from an emotional standpoint, nobody gives a fuck what's going on with a black man. There's no group that cares. I I would say though that I would I would concur that the well I would I will affirm that black women get get the worst treatment because even through our you know our like your mutual contact I didn't know you knew Statues um Statues um has been experiencing some of the worst treatment from our law enforcement and from our city uh from the from the media um, for her standing up for the rights of for human rights 
and they dragged her, but nobody came to her aid. You know, statues is someone that isn't safe, you know, and nobody cares. Nobody wants to stand up for her because she's too, you know, in their their minds, too loud, too, 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 too aggressive, black. too, too black, and that's too what, strong. We right. talked about that. And, it, and, and that's what I said. I think black women are the most targeted attack. I think black men are the most lonely. And the reason why I say that is because we're still men. Right? We're not allowed to have these feelings, right? Like a woman can have a mental health breakdown and it's somewhat understood. You know what I mean? It's that they're emotional creatures. There's that gray area where you know a woman's gonna get mad, all that stereotypical shit. A guy can't just be like I'm having a bad day. Right? And it goes back to that adage that and I think there's a comedian called Deborah Wooten Williams. She's uh, got a uh, spinal spina bifida. And she's also got uh, cerebral, uh, what was it, polio, right? And when she was a kid, she was like, I don't have polio, I'm black. I, I, I can't, you know what I mean? I can't, I can't be disabled, I'm black. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm already yeah. black. What else are you going to do to me? And I think we have this. So I, I, and I want, I think I'll let you steal this if you like it. I no longer say I have trauma, I have survival skills. Hmm. I have a trauma-based response on being able to survive. Mm. I like that. I like that. You know, survival um, skills aren't survival. It's not something you hone, right? Mm -hmm. Most people really don't hone how to survive in life. They just go through mm -hmm. so much shit, right? That they figure out mechanisms to make themselves live. Right. But, you know, I, I don't know. I, I like I agree with you. And, you know, um, partially because I, I think that, you know, some of the response that we do, we don't even really think it through. We don't even we take so take it for granted that we discovered a way of surviving, you know, but there's other parts where I could say that I develop survival skills that I could teach anyone. Right. Because black people are pushed to the edge of society, but we are pushing the edge of society. You know, we're, 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 we're expanding the knowledge um, on how to live your life. That's why it's important to follow black autists because black autists will tell you a thing or two on how to handle trauma. We'll tell you a thing or two well, on and how I'm not saying, I'm not yeah. saying it's not a skill, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm no longer saying I have great survival skills. Right. I have yeah. I have been I have great trauma trauma based responses. Right, right. I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a it's a I think it's a I guess what I'm saying is that it's a combination of both. It's Oh yeah, it's, I, I agree with you. And I'm not saying it's all one. And that's what I want to clarify. It's not all one or the other. It's all one, yeah. But I know for a fact a lot of us who who dealt with homelessness and dealt with, you know, substance abuse and dealt with mental health issues we don't have the greatest survival instincts. It's that we've dealt with so much trauma, we've figured out how to survive. Right, right. And so what I mean by that is the same. You take us and put us out in a regular environment where people love you and are nice to you. We don't know how to act. So we're not good at surviving. <laughs> right. Right? Did you give right. me a healthy, a healthy situation? I don't function well. I'm learning how to self-love. Oh, you're going to say hi to me every day? You're not going to make a negative comment to say it's like, right, 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 it's not, right. It's, it's not a slight to say hi. Like, what's up, Baldy? How you doing, so, Mister Clean? Right, like, oh, right, fuck. right. Now, I don't mean anything by it. That's just how I was raised to talk to people. Right, that's kind of our quote unquote culture is to kind of have a knock and talk shit. Right, but when you get to a place where everybody's like, "Good morning, Ryan. How are you today? It is a pleasure to see you. We are so happy you're here." In the back of my mind, I'm just like, ah. <laughs> yeah. You know, people have been telling me on this channel, and I'm like, how? They're like, you're famous because they see 27,000 followers. I'm like, you know, like, I'm not famous. Like, I don't see myself as, um, you know, this public figure, but they're like, oh my God, he talked to me. I, I've been having large audience for a very long time. I've had multiple platforms. I had my podcasts and all kinds of stuff. 
um, I've always been moving and grooving and, you know, I've been on the news and all that stuff, but I've never considered myself as famous. I never looked at myself as an idol. I never looked at myself as anything. And, and that's also due to my conditioning. That's just how I was raised, right? Not to feel like you could gloat in, you know, some of your accomplishments. You know, I always think that I'm not good enough because I'm not good enough, still not good enough to get a sponsorship deal, not good enough to get mutual aid, not good enough to get the basic things that I need. So when people say, oh, you know, hi, how's it going? I'm always thinking, what's next? You're going to stab me? You know, you can stab me right here because I've been stabbed, stabbed all the way over here. But you can stab me right here. Just do it now first and then let me... So what Statue S has been te teaching me is to self-affirm, is to to be happy and to be in my glow and be in my shine and just to recognize that not everybody, you know, wants to hurt me. And, you know, and that's that's something that you have to learn, especially when you have autism, because um, it's a mindfuck. When I was in I was brought into this this house, this house is humongous. And by myself with my son, I'm a, you know, I'm a, a I'm a, a, I'm a, I'm a dad and, you know, being homeless and then coming into this place, it was like a refuge. Um, I was, I was in my bed for two, two months, just quivering because I was so traumatized by this experience. Um, and I was like, how am I going to get over these autistic symptoms so that I can get back to work? Because I can't stay in this man's house forever. Um, you know, and it was frightening. And I was even more concerned because I was like, what if he like I watched too many horror movies? I'm like, why is he going to chop me up and put me? Because there was like, <laughs> there's a big there's a big like a river and like uh, like where my house is. It there's just like a Water national park. Yeah, yeah. I got you. So I'm like, what if I just go missing? My family, nobody cared. <laughs> they did not care. Nobody cared to, to check in. And so I cut people off at that moment. I was just like, cut, 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 cut. Because I'm like, if you guys don't think that I'm not okay, I'm not okay because I'm in a white person's house and I don't know him from Adam. I just know him because he was a playing, paying client of mine and I didn't understand his generosity. You know, and that is that is what what racism does to you that is what um that is what you know ableism does to you when you all your life been treated like scum of the earth and you don't believe you deserve to have people love you and care for you and just to just to do things for you that you never gotten in your life so you know i had to re indigenize i had to reformat my thinking um to just take in the blessings when they come um and that was hard it's funny you say that because uh, I had it happen and then I had it bite me in the ass with the same person. So I, I think that's the other problem is that sometimes when we've had help, we get the help, we take the help, we accept the help. And then three, two, three, four years later, it's your piece of shit because I helped you. Whoa. <laughs> and, and, and I'll explain. I remember uh, in 2000, right before COVID. So what was that? 2019, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I went, my friend had a uh, car, he bought a car and uh, was, he actually was moving to Canada because he's getting deported, Indian guy, right? And he was selling it. And I happened to ask him, hey, what are you doing with your car? He's like, I'm selling it, I can't use it, but I got to sell it in the next three days. And I was like, I wish I had 13 grand to give you or I'd take it. And he's like, you know what, you can have the car. And I was like, what? He was like, no, you can have it. I'm not going to sell it. You can fly down to San Francisco and get it. I'll give it to you. And like you said, I was like, okay. Right? And so I get down there. I get this car. And I'm like, uh, all right. And I'm like, so what's wrong with the car? And he's like, nothing. And he's like, you can call my friend back home. They'll get the paperwork. We'll get it signed. And I'm just like, something's not right here. You know what I mean? Like you said, like, this is what's going to happen. Is it going to get reported stolen? Whatever. And sure shit, the Indian guy was like, hey, man, it's just 13 grand. Mm -hmm. I was just like, what? It's just, yeah, it's just 13 grand, right? Mm -hmm. And then not only that, but it's not a big deal, right? We give, you know, I, if I didn't give it to you, I'd just lose the 13 grand. So I might as well just give it to you. But then the shitty thing was, is a couple of years ago, he wanted to tell me about how I didn't appreciate it. 
because I wasn't, you know, I got some tickets or I got these speeding tickets. And they, you have no right to talk to me like that. <laughs> right. I accepted your help. I appreciated your help. But you don't get to come back th- three years later and be like, well, you wrecked the car and you got some money for the car. So you bought a different car. Once you give me some money, you don't get to. That's not how this works. Right. You don't get to then. And I think that's like you talked about as black people, especially black autists and the shit you go through. One person burns you like that. You're like, you know what? I'm never going to take anybody help again. Right. Right. One person makes you feel bad for needing help. and You're like, fuck you. I'm not going to ask for help again. Right. Right. And that was I like when I talked to Statue S and, and I loved you how you talked about not being. Pardon my French nigga. We're famous. We are both famous. Because there are people that we inspire that we don't even know. Mm-hmm. And the level of fame has nothing to do with money. I think that's where me and you get confused on. Because being autistic, we're like, if we're famous, then we should be fucking rich. I'm not rich, therefore I'm not mm-hmm. Right? But with this internet fame today and the social media fame and all this other stuff, we are famous. There are people that we impact on a daily basis that we don't know. Statue S is one of the people I was impacting on a daily basis that I didn't know. Mm-hmm. And that's how we got involved is because she was like, I need you to meet Ryan. I was like, why? He was like, you two both impact me a lot with what you guys do. And I was oh. Ooh. Wow. Right? So when I looked at your page, I was like, hey, that's a dark-skinned Canadian version of me. <laughs> 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 right? I might not always go into, like, it's kind of based on autism. But if you read my posts, I talk about my feelings a lot and my ups and downs and where I'm going. People don't understand that I'm autistic. I'm go- That's what the problem is. They're like, why are you all over the place? Because I'm autistic. I'm Asperger's. Right. I'm just voicing to you my frustrations instead of keeping them all inside. And right. I'm not truly voicing them. I'm just telling you what I feel in the moment. Because about two or three le- hours later, I usually feel better, feel worse, or I'm worried about something else. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right? right. Am I wrong? Like, you yeah, know what I'm you're, talking about? You're right. Even though I might be in this moment right now really pissed off, a half hour later, somebody makes a comment that distracts me, and I'm not even mad about what I was mad about. I'm mad about that person commenting, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's the huge part is that people don't understand that, like, we're people. I can't wait to have Statue S on. By the way, I'm glad you brought her up. I should say them up because their situation's unique. Um, I didn't know. I won't get into um, that, that, that right now, but I didn't know them as well as I thought I did. Mm-hmm. And so I had them on my Black and Proud show, and I was like, I'm not sure you're proud. And then they told me, and I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, you definitely hit the bar. I didn't know. And then I'm over here Googling shit. <laughs> and I was, okay, yeah, I want to know more, right? So I think that's the thing is a lot of people really don't know what you are behind that face, right? You're right. a good-looking young man. You know, I look at when you look at your picture, like the one we use for our headshots, we're both in suits, we're both well dressed, we look well kept. There can't be anything wrong with you. You don't look like you got something wrong with you, Ryan. Why do you talk? Right. Right? <laughs> right, right. But you know, at the same time, it's like uh um, you know, all like I think neurotypicals are really used to wearing clown suits. Or you know what I mean? Like, um the thing about thing about bigotry and systemic oppression and stuff like that is that the key thing to it is social hierarchy and you know you'll find that the people who follow the rules that get everything done are the ones that are more likely to be racist homophobic transphobic um you know uh ableist classist you go down the line because you need social hierarchy in order to enforce these sort of systems um, you don't need to teach someone how to be racist. You just need to draw a, um, you know, you just need to draw a um, comparison between the haves and the have nots. You just have to draw a comparison between those who are in power and those who are not and those who are not in power. And if you can group them all into one group, that's marginalization. That's how you, that's how we look at marginalization is people that are not in power, not making decisions. And you look around, black people are not in power. You know, if, if only black, one black person in power, everybody else around them is white, you know, regardless, um, you know, depending on how you're marginalized, 
um, you could see that most of marginalized people are not making power decisions and stuff like that. So it's very easy to, um, you know, it's very easy for people to to be able to see um, social hierarchy in its place. But when you see people following the rules and putting on the clown suits and doing all that stuff and going through, um, you know, going through the uh, the dynamics of of life, um, you know, they're doing it because they want to uphold the social hierarchy because they believe that they have to go up the ladder. Reindigenizing is us removing the social hierarchy and allowing people to affirm as they are and using harmony principles to harmonize with one another, um, you know, so that we can all coexist in the same space. But when you have equity in land and you have equity, because our ancestors did not know anything about land equity, right? Like, owning something colonizing something and then you know giving people permission to use the land right because that you have wasn't to... even that wasn't even part of our culture also because to us we don't own land earth is you know what i mean we're a nomad people we were tribal so while we had territories of lands that we 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 worked nobody owned shit right, right. nobody owned you didn't own the hut the village owned the hut and if the fucking storm came we moved the village right we did right. <laughs> the village doesn't stay here now it's raised right. in this region somewhere because this is our region, but we don't own the land. The animals own the land. We take care of the animals, right? Like there's this whole inclusive thing, and I, I, I man, we're yeah. almost, we only got like ten minutes left, and I'm almost sad. I'm like, we could talk. This has been awesome. I know it's not over yet, but I'm like, I kind of <laughs> like you, Ryan. Yeah, You're but one of you my know, new best friends. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> just just like you know, like uh, just on that point, it's just. You know, we can move and we never that's why poverty was never a thing is because we had that ability to move where Mother Nature wanted us to go. And now we have to stay stationed and we have to accept it. Now we have all these different meditation strategies just so that we can cope because we can't move. And, you know, that's the point. Bringing it back to autism is like that's the point of it all you know, is to teach people that they need to budge, they need to move, they need to recognize that social hierarchy, especially with us autists, don't really matter. Um, you know, it, ah. we are just, you know, it doesn't matter to us. We don't like autonomy. You know, we don't like someone having autonomy over us, right? So no. the I told point my is, boss is the to other be day, inclusive. Is, and I don't know if it's my autism, but I think you might be, agree with this. I don't give a fuck if I get fired if I'm right. If I'm morally right, and it morally makes sense to me, I'll die. I'll die on that mountain. And I think it's the whole idea we're logic based, right? Like, like you said, Tina just said something to me. So I'm going to cuss her the fuck out. Well, you're not allowed to cuss her the fuck out. I don't give a shit. She's not allowed to say that to me. We're going to have right. to fire you, Ryan, because you cussed out Tina. Tina called me the N word. We don't care about that right now. All we care about is your response. I got fired like that once. Lady mm -hmm. said the N word to me. I reported it to HR. They tried to blow it over. And I was like, we're not blowing this the fuck over. Fuck you. Fuck her. Shit, if she did this on the street, I'd probably have somebody smack the shit out of her. And they were like, what'd you say? I said, oh, you heard me. And they're like, you can't say that. She can't say nigga. She said nigga. What do you mean I can't say that? You know what I mean? Like, and I've I've got to that point where I just, whew, I've, I've, I've finally figured out when I'm in crises and when I get that emotionally wound up, I have to walk away because my responses are not safe. When I get wound up, even though it's for the right reasons, mm -hmm. I'm now going to become dangerous to white people and a threat. And so I'm no longer, you know what I mean? I've had multiple times where Caucasian people have interacted with me and started a fight and I'm ready to fight. Now that I'm ready to fight, I might go to jail. Hold on. Oh, I didn't even start this. I'm just now responding and now giving you the energy you gave me. Now I'm wrong, right? And so I think for for a lot of us, and like Statuess even talked about, like now she's the angry black woman because she responded to what y'all said, right? Like that, mm. that, that piece, right? And as an autist, what I'm finding is that in our own community, right? of autists. I had somebody just be, one day wanted to give me a hard time about how I called, are we autistic or a person with autism or all this other shit? And I was like, look here, Karen, I really don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, you <don't, laughs> if you don't like how I called my autism autism, 
go fuck yourself, Karen. I don't care. Let's not, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, I find us now splitting hairs on that. Like, how can we all get together and just be autists? Or we're not autists. Some people are autistic. I have autism. You know, like, there's so, and I, I, I guess I'll say I'll end it on this. I, I, I'm finally in social work. I'm working with homeless people. I work with those with mental health issues. I work with those with substance abuse issues. And what I would challenge you to do, and I think you already do it, is you do some sort of work that is based upon your lived experience, right? Mm-hmm. And so when you do that, you're able to be an expert in your field and be very good because guess what? I know what I've lived through. That makes me an expert, right? <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And so now that I'm getting into those spaces, like you said, I'm able to advocate. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to be famous not for comedy anymore. I want to be famous in the way you're famous, in the way I'm starting to become famous, of being the person who talks about this shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a way to, to slip the contraband over the border. I feel like I can target racism. I can target all the forms of oppression through neurodiversity. Not saying that it doesn't exist within our, you know, within within this culture even on its own. <laughs> That's what I was hitting at, yeah, but you go ahead, yeah. Yeah, but it's a way because when you target the mind, there's nowhere to go. You know, you can't reduce it down to anything else, you know, because we do the same things. We show up late the same, you know, what, what, what people are telling me, especially if they're from the white community, they're telling me that, well, I show up late sometimes too. I misspell things too. I do this too. So there are a lot of parallels to what I've always been criticized for, for being black. You know, so I feel like it's, you know, targeting neurodiversity is a way of being able to slip the contraband over the border to be able to address these uh, systemic oppression um, devices um, and but do so with white people on my side and do so where we're not dividing each other, but we are empowering each other and challenging each other to lift each other up. This is the first time I've ever felt community with white folks and you know, and that's hard because I, in every other community, I've never felt like I was a part of them. But this community, I do feel part of the community. And I do feel like, you know, because we're autistic and we, sometimes we have our, our biases and stuff like that. And, and I'm not going to hold you on that. But I, I do I do recognize that we're autistic first. And it, it, it my comfort level has, you know, is through the roof and my walls have come down and I can trust po- folks within this community to be able to carry out these messages. So, you know, uh, I think advocating for what we're advocating for the human aspect of things and targeting the brain um, is a great way of doing activism. Um, you know, it's, and you, you know, and then when people get comfortable with the message, then we can start talking about some of the deeper issues that are plaguing us in our society. I don't disagree with you at all, I, and I appreciate that. I've been able to find some allies. I guess that's what the way to put it is we've been able to form some base-level allyship and then be able to carry that into a different level, a different conversation. And right. I would agree with that. Like being, I, We're going to have you on again because we didn't even talk about your diagnosis. We didn't even get into the good stuff. We've just been chatting about some of the surface stuff. You know what I mean? And I don't mean it's all surface and surface, but you know what I mean? I feel like we could dive into a whole bunch more. But I think you hit it on the nose there is that becoming autistic or dying, being diagnosed autistic or, or identifying as neurodivergent gives you a sense of a support group. Right. And I think I, 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 I'm not going to... There's obviously autists that are racist, right? But I, I tell people this all the time. There's a large propensity for LGBTQ in autists and neurodivergent people. And do you know why that is? I say it's because it's based on logic. The idea of love is I like someone and being around them all the time. Right. Well, I like Johnny. I always like to hang out with Johnny. We eat lunch every day. I guess I'm gay. Right? Not, not literally, right? But that's the idea. I love this person, so if I love him, let's be in love, right? Right. I think that's also why there's not that many racists that are autists because it doesn't logically make sense. Right. And so it takes somebody who's in a home of racists for them to be racist. And most of the time, even in my dealing, 
when you have a kid that's in special needs, when I was a paraeducator, even as a kid, the kid's not racist. He's just repeating the words that his parents are saying. Right. Right. He, but, but at the same time, I'll go back to what I said earlier, is that racism doesn't need to be taught. It just needs to be observed. You Bingo. know, when you see people in power that look like you and you see people who are not in power that look like you, or if you see people not following the rules, you were taught rules. This is the rules. This is how you behave. This is how you eat your fork or use your fork. This is how you do all this stuff. And then you see black people on TV not following the rules. Immediately, you become racist. <laughs> and people don't see how quick and easy it is for you to to formulate racist belief systems because for social hierarchy, you need to follow the rules. And if you follow the rules uh, and then you watch people breaking the rules, you think that you're better than them because they're breaking the rules and you're not realizing that they're breaking the rules because there's systemic oppression and that there are things that they have to do to go outside of the rules like black people don't just come on camera you know shucking and jiving black people just know you know that if they entertain folks that they can get a little bit of fame and a little bit of money so that they can feed their family you know so you're seeing dynamics um that you think black people are just breaking the rules and not doing what they should. And that's it. But it's the same with ableism, right? It's the same thing is that, you know, ableist, uh, you know, people that have autism have to break the rules. We have to do things in a different way and we can't show up the way that it's supposed to. But when we break the rules, what are they saying? Oh, you're asking for handouts. You're yeah. asking for this. Yeah. You're doing this. Yeah. Why are you so special? Why do you deserve this? You can talk. You can do this. And and these are the, you know, again, it's following the rules. If you're not following the rules, then I'm better than you because I can. And people don't even look at it like that. But I really dived into what makes a person racist. And it's easy to become racist because you see it all over the place you see black people dancing and you see them doing it something differently and it's like oh they do this but we do this but we're better at we're better because we i see everyone of my family in government these people are not in government so therefore i think i'm better because my family's in government and these people aren't and you know and this is why they aren't because they don't do this and they don't do that so it, you don't have to be taught ra racism to be a racist. You know, you just have to look at your society and, you know, and understand the rules, you know, and understand that, you know, and then your father tells you, well, son, you have to do this and you do this. You got to shake a person's hand. You got to look them in the eye. Right. And then we yeah. autists don't look the people in the I eye. Know. I've noticed that. I've been staring you in the eye. I'm very good at looking at. I'm so I'm very good at eye contact until I notice people don't like my eye contact, and then I don't. I've been noticing it's been hard for you to look me in the eye the whole time. You look here, you look there. Everybody's different. I get it. You know what I mean? But right. And and I, and I think that's a great place to end on. The reason why I think Barack Obama was the greatest president of our lifetime was because of what you just said. It had nothing to do with him, what his political policies were. It was for a generation of people that got to see a black man be a president of the United States, which is, quote unquote, the most powerful position in the world. Whether right. or not he did his job properly, whether or not he did anything else, that representation in itself that a non-white man could run our country was worth it. Thank yeah. you for your time, Ryan. We've done an hour, man. I'm going to have yeah. you back on in a couple months. Oh, I'll shit. have to get you on my podcast too. Oh shit! All right, that's how yeah. it works. Tell them what your podcast is, Ryan, so we can get you a couple more followers. Um, Pathway to the Heart. You know, we've been. Um, it was formerly known as Hustle Zone, um, Hustle Zone TV, but now it's called Pathway to the Heart. You can check me out at digitalstemcell.ca. Um, you know, I have a full membership zone where you can learn everything about everything to do with neurodiversity, inclusivity, and so on and so forth. Um, and then Hustle Zone TV, if you are, or HustleZone.com, where you learn everything about black culture, you can go and learn about history and all that stuff. You can follow me there. Um, and then, of course, check me out on my social medias, um, Digital Stem Cell, Calibrated Dyslexia on TikTok, um, and then Hustle Zone. You know, all these places you can learn a thing or two. I am a digital stem cell because, 
you can't put me in a box. You know, I pretty much adapt to all situations and I have multiple uh, special interests that span, you know, people like I have a large footprint and it's just because my brain just goes there. So, you know, I call myself digital stem cell because there's nothing else I can call myself. So I call Ta-da. myself suit man because I, I have a wonderful wardrobe. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you do. Not, that's always why I call myself suit man. That and I've got, <laughs> I've got I got a good palette color. Hey, it's been a pleasure. I wanted to tell everybody, um, and I think you guys need to hear this. Don't always judge a book by its cover. We are two successful, good-looking, healthy black men who are struggling. I just found out I lost my home, right? Because I had an autistic episode. And my, my, my landlord was badgering about how I have my own opinions and I should get my own place. And I was like, if you keep contacting me, I'm going to call the police and say this is harassment. Because mm-hmm. it was. And then next thing you know, it was, well, we don't want to renew with you because you said you were going to call the police. Yeah, you were harassing me. But we don't like you anymore. So we're going to give you a four-month lease, and now you got to move. I've been paying rent there for four years on time. That's the only thing I'm supposed to do as a tenant. Why would you, you know what I mean? But that's a different conversation. My point is, is support black autists. Support black artists, support artists in general. And remember, just because you see the smile, just because you see a good looking motherfucker on the outside, don't mean we're not crying and dying on the inside, if you know what I mean. Am I right? That's right. For tuning in, all of Ryan's followers. Hopefully, I'll be on his podcast soon. You'll see uh, Ryan will be back with us in June for Dating with Disabilities. So catch him out on that. Thank you for tuning in today. And you guys have a great day, you guys. Awesome. Wasn't too bad, right? Yeah, 